India is a land of varied physical features. It has the Himalayas, beaches in Kerala, the Thar Desert in Rajasthan, and the Deccan Plateau. Even the color of the soil varies from one region to another. For example, in Maharashtra, you find both black soil and red soil. But in Madhya Pradesh, you will find only red soil. This variation in soils is due to the kind of rocks from which they are made. The relief and physical features of India have evolved through different geological periods. During the process of formation of India, as it looks today, the Indian land mass was subjected to erosion, weathering and deposition. The physical features of India that you see today are the result of all these processes. No one knows exactly how India was formed. However, scientists have several theories that try to explain the process. One such theory is the theory of plate tectonics. According to this theory, the Earth's crust is formed from seven major and some minor plates. When the plates move, they cause disturbances in the continental crust. This leads to faulting. Faulting and volcanic activity. In fact, most volcanoes are located at the edges of the plates. These plates are classified into Convergent boundary, divergent boundary, and transform boundary. Convergent boundary is formed when two plates converge or move towards each other. Divergent boundary is formed when two plates move away from each other. Transform boundary is formed when two plates move towards each other but finally end up sliding past each other. So, how is this theory applicable to India? Peninsular India is a part of an ancient supercontinent Gondwana land. Gondwana land originally consisted of a number of land masses, including South America, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica, as well as the Indian subcontinent all joined together. What then happened to split Gondwana land? Convectional currents split up the crust of Gondwana land into smaller parts, of which the Indian plate was one.
the Indian plate drifted north till it collided with the Eurasian plate. The collision caused the sedimentary rocks in the Tethi Sea to be lifted upwards. This is how the Himalayas were formed. This uplift also created a depression in the north. Over time, this depression formed a basin that got filled with the sediments of rivers flowing from the mountains. We now know this area, which is rich in fertile alluvial soil, as the northern plains of India. Different physical features of India were formed at different times. The oldest physical feature is the Peninsula Plateau. It is composed of igneous and metamorphic rocks and has hills and wide valleys. The Himalayas are a relatively younger physical feature. They consist of high peaks deep valleys and rivers that are fast flowing. Geologists believe that the Himalayas are still continuing to rise by one centimeter every year. The Himalayas are fold mountains that cover the northern border of India. They are geologically young as compared to other mountain ranges. The Himalayan range is the highest and the most rugged mountain range in the world. It extends from the river Indus in the west to the Brahmaputra in the east, forming an arc of about 2,400 kilometers. The width of this range varies. For instance, in Kashmir, the range is 400 kilometers wide. While in Arunachal Pradesh, the width decreases to 150 kilometers. If you compare the eastern and the western halves of the range, then you will find considerably more difference in the altitudes of various mountains in the western half. The Himalayas are formed from three parallel ranges of mountains. The Himadri, the Himachal, and the Shualiks. Several valleys lie between these mountain ranges. The Himadri, also called the Great or Inner Himalayas, is the northernmost range of the Himalayas. This range is in a single, unbroken line and has the highest peaks. Considering that the average height of peaks in the Himadri is 6,000 meters. It is not surprising to note that the important peaks of the Himalayas are located in this range. For example, Mount Everest, the highest peak in the world, and Mount Godwin Austin, the second highest peak in the world, are all part of this range. Mount Everest is located in Nepal, while Mount Godwin Austin is in Ladakh in India. As mentioned earlier, the Himalayas are fold mountains. However, the great Himalayan folds are not completely symmetrical. This is why the peaks dip slightly away from the center. The core of the Himalayan range is composed of granite. The lofty heights of the mountains of the Great Himalayan range mean that the peaks are snow-clad all the year round. As a result, no vegetation grows on these mountains. However, 
several glaciers such as the Gangotri and the Saichen originate from this range. These glaciers feed rivers that form the source of water for a large part of the population. The Zoji La Pass is also situated in the Great Himalayan Range. This pass is the only link between Ladakh and Kashmir. The next range, which is known as the Himachal, is located south of the Greater Himalayas. The height of mountains in this range is between 3700 and 4500 meters as against the average height of 6000 meters in the Great Himalayas. Hence, this range is also referred to as the Lesser Himalayas. The average width of the Himachal range is 50 kilometers. This range has the roughest terrain among all the mountain ranges in the world. The terrain of the mountain range is composed of highly compressed rocks that have undergone considerable change in composition or appearance. In other words, the Himachal is made up of altered rocks. Let us look at some of the prominent ranges in the Himachal. The Pir Panjal is the longest range in the Lesser Himalayas. The other notable ranges are the Dhaula Dhar and the Mahabharat. These ranges are famous for their beauty and are a major tourist attraction for people the world over. The Himachal Range is also well known for its hill stations such as Dalhousie, Shimala, Rani Khet and Nani Tal. Of these, Dalhousie and Shimala are located in Himachal Pradesh, while Rani Khet and Nani Tal are part of Uttarkhand. The most picturesque of valleys, the Kashmir, Kullu and Kangara valleys in Himachal Pradesh are part of this area. The range south of the Himachal, that is, the outermost range of the Himalayas, is the Shivalik range. The Shivaliks are 10 to 50 kilometers wide. The heights of these mountains range from 900 to 1100 meters. Thus, as you can see, the Shivaliks form the lowest range of the Himalayas. This is because this range is built from loose sediments brought down by the rivers flowing from the main Himalayan ranges located up north. The sediment consists of broken stones and soil. Therefore, the valleys of the Shivalik region are covered with thick gravel and alluvium. You may have heard of Dehradun. The famous hill station of Masuri is located in the Dehradun Valley in the state of Uttarkhand. The longitudinal valleys that lie between the Himachal and the Shivaliks are known as dunes. That's how the most famous valleys, including Dehradun, Kotlidun, and Patlidun, got their names. Kotlidun is located in the Jammu region and is known for its scenic beauty. And you must have all heard about the Jim Corbett National Park. This park is located in the Patli Dun region.
we just looked at the longitudinal divisions of the Himalayas. The Himalayas are also divided into regions from east to west. You can make out these regions if you look at the demarcations between river valleys. Let's look at some examples of these divisions. First, let's consider the area between the Indus and the Sutlej. This area has been traditionally known as the Punjab Himalaya. Nanga Parbat is the highest peak in Punjab Himalaya. However, on the basis of regional divisions of the Himalayas, locally it is also called Kashmir in the west and Himachal Himalaya in the east. To take another example, the Kumaon Himalayas is the name used regionally for the portion of the Himalayas between the Sutlej and the Kali rivers. Nanda Devi is the highest peak in this region. The hill stations Nainital and Rani Khet are located in the Kumaon region. Similarly, the area that lies between the Kali and the Tista rivers is known as the Nepal Himalayas. The Assam Himalayas refer to the region between the Tista and the Dihang rivers. As we move east, we come to the division of the Himalayas called the Puravanchal or the eastern hills and mountains. The Brahmaputra forms the easternmost boundary of the Puravanchal region. The Brahmaputra breaks through the Himalayas to form some deep valleys or gorges. One such valley is Arunachal Pradesh in the Dihang Gorg. Beyond the Dihang Gorg, the Puravanchal hills dip sharply southwards and stretch out along the eastern borders of India. Thus, the Puravanchal hills extend through the northeastern states of India. The Puravanchal hills are covered by thick forests and mostly consist of parallel ranges and valleys. Strong sandstone, a type of sedimentary rock, is the main component of these mountains. Let's take a closer look at the Puravanchal Range. The Puravanchal Range is made up of the Patkai Hills, the Naga Hills, the Manipur Hills and the Mizo Hills. The Northern Plain is located in the southern part of the Himalayan range. The plain is formed from the flood plains of three big river systems, the Indus, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra. Based on the names of these river systems, the northern plain is also called the Indo-Gangetic Plain. The alluvium from these river systems was deposited in the vast basin at the foothills of the Himalayas over millions of years. These deposits built up to form the present-day fertile northern plain. The plain spans the area of a small country. Can you estimate the area of the plain? The area of the plain is about 7 lakh square kilometers. The width of this plain varies as you go from north to south. At its narrowest, it stretches across 240 kilometers. 
at its widest it stretches across 320 kilometers the length of the plane is 2400 kilometers as mentioned earlier the soil cover in this plane is rich and fertile and water is found in plenty combined with a favorable climate for growing several major crops the northern plain is one of the world's most intensively farmed areas therefore it is not surprising to note that the northern plain is a very densely populated physiographic division of India. Did you know, not just in India, the Northern Plain is one of the most populated areas on Earth. Let's come back to the river systems that helped in the formation of the Northern Plains. The rivers coming from the Northern Mountain carry a huge load of eroded soil and debris. As a river flows down towards the plains, due to the gentler slopes, its velocity decreases and the material carried by it gets deposited on the way. These deposits can lead to the creation of riverine islands. For example, in the Brahmaputra River flowing through Assam lies an island called Majuli. This island is famed to be the largest inhabited riverine island in the world. The speed of the rivers reduces further as they go downstream. Due to the deposition of huge quantities of silt, these rivers split into numerous channels. These channels are called distributaries. The sediments from the mouths of all the distributaries collect to form a delta. For example, the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta is an important part of the northern plain. In fact, with the expansion of the deltas, the northern plain is becoming bigger as well. Now, we'll take a closer look at the northern plain. The northern plain can be divided into three main parts. Starting from the top, the western part of the northern plain comes first. This part is formed by the Indus and its tributaries. The Indus and its tributaries, the Jhelum, the Chinab, the Ravi, the Bias, and the Sutlej originate in the Himalaya. These rivers lies the fertile state of Punjab. This part of the northern plain is also called the Punjab plain. If you look at a map of India, however, you will find that a bigger portion of the Punjab plain lies in Pakistan. Did you know the name Punjab is made of two words, Panj and Ab. Panj means five and Ab means water. As you can see, the name Punjab 
is based on the five rivers that drain the state. In fact, this section of the northern plain is dominated by Doabs. Do means two and ab means water. So, a doab is a piece of land drained by two water bodies. The map shows the doabs that comprise Punjab. For example, Jech Doab lies between the Jhelum and the Chinab River. Let's move to the next part of the northern plain, the Ganga plain. This plain consists of the middle portion of the northern plain and lies between the Ghaggar and the Tista rivers. The Ganga plain spreads over most states of North India. It covers Haryana, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and parts of Jharkhand and West Bengal. Finally, the eastern portion of the northern plain is called the Brahmaputra plain. This plain lies in the state of Assam. So, which states of India are covered by the northern plain? The different states that fall under the northern plain are Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, parts of Jharkhand and West Bengal and Assam. What kind of relief features do you think the northern plain displays. People generally think of the northern plain as a region that has uniformly flat land all across. That's not quite true. You can find quite a bit of variety of relief features in the northern plain. In fact, Based on these variations in relief, you can divide the northern plain into four regions. Bhabar, Tirai, Bhangar and Khadar. Let's find out more about these regions and the features that each of these regions displays. We begin with the Bhabar region. The Bhabar region is a narrow belt of level surface in the northern plain, lying parallel to the slope of the Shivaliks. This region is about 8 to 16 kilometers wide and consists of pebbles deposited by the rivers after they flow down from the mountains. Interestingly, all the streams disappear in the Babar belt. Therefore, the level of groundwater is very deep here. Moving south of the Babar belt, you come to the next region, Tirai. All rivers and streams that disappear in the Babar belt resurface in this region. The Tirai region consists of wet, swampy and marshy land. The high water table creates a lot of springs and wetlands in this region. Earlier, the Tirai region was thickly forested and abundant with wildlife. However, urbanization 
has taken its toll. And the forests have been cleared. In some places, to obtain agricultural land. And in others, to provide for the people who migrated from Pakistan at the time of the partition. You may have heard of the Dudwa National Park. This park is located in the plains of the Terai in Uttar Pradesh. Billy Arjan Singh, a famous conservationist, led the effort to establish Dudwa as a sanctuary of the swamp deer. The next region, called Bhangar, is the largest part of the northern plain. Bhangar is formed of older alluvium. This region lies above the flood plains of the rivers. It, therefore, has a terrace like appearance. The soil in the Bhanga region contains calcareous deposits. It forms sheets across the alluvial plains. In India, these deposits are called Kankar. So, what happens to the newer deposits of the flood plains? The newer, younger deposits of the flood plains form the fourth region of the northern plain. This region is called Khadar. The alluvial deposits in this region are renewed every year. Therefore, the land is fertile and used extensively for agriculture. As you may know, plateaus are also called table lands. The peninsula plateau is also a table land. This table land was formed when Gondwana land broke and the pieces drifted apart. Gondwana land is the southern part of the ancient supercontinent Pangaea with Angara land in the northern part. Thus, the peninsula plateau is part of a very old land mass. This is also evident in the composition of the plateau. It is composed of old crystalline, igneous and metamorphic rocks. What kind of relief would you find on a tableland? The peninsula plateau consists of both broad and shallow valleys and rounded hills. Based on the relief, the peninsula plateau has two broad divisions, the central highlands and the Deccan plateau. Let's check out these areas on the map. The central highlands refer to the portion of the peninsula plateau that lies to the north of the Narmada River. It covers a majority of the Malwa plateau. The Vindhya range forms the boundary of the central highlands on the south. The Aravalis form the northwestern boundary of these highlands. The Vindhya range has a special significance because it divides India geographically into northern India or the Indo-Gangetic plain and southern India. Moving a little west along the Vindhya range, the peninsula plateau gradually merges into the sandy and rocky desert of Rajasthan. Let's take a look at the rivers in this region.
they are the chambal the sindh the betwa and the ken as they flow from the southwest direction to the northeast direction they give you a fair indication which way the mountains slope in this region if you observe the layout of the central highlands on the map the highlands seem to be wider in the west than in the east let's move eastwards in the central highlands you may have heard of bundelkhand the famous khajuraho temples are in this part of the country bundelkhand is the local name for the eastward extensions of the peninsula plateau the other eastward extension is bhagelkhand further east you will come across the chota nagpur plateau this is the eastern extension of the central highlands the damodar is an important river that drains this region now we move on to the other part of the peninsula plateau the deccan plateau if you observe the shape of the plateau on the map you will see that it is a triangular landmass lying to the south of the narmada the broad base of this triangle is in the north and the narrow tip of the triangle is in the south the satpura range borders this base in the north on its eastern side it has the mahadev hills the kaimur hills and the maikal range the deccan plateau is higher in the west and slopes gently eastwards in the northeast is an extension of the plateau called the meghalaya and karbi anglong plateau it is believed that due to the force exerted by the movement of the indian plate at the time of the formation of the himalayas a huge fault was created this fault demarcates the meghalaya and karbi anglong plateau from the chota nagpur plateau there are three prominent hill ranges in the on the north eastern side of the plateau as you move from east to west you can see the garo range the khasi ranges and the jantia hill moving southwards over the deccan plateau you will observe that it is bordered by western ghats on the west and the eastern ghats on the east if you compare the ranges on both the sides of the deccan plateau you will see a number of interesting differences the western ghats lie parallel to the western coast they are continuous and can be crossed through passes only for example the thal ghat and the bhor ghat passes act as links between the interiors of the deccan plateau and mumbai another pass the pal ghat gap found on the kerala tamil nadu border serves as a major communication route between the two states the eastern ghats stretch from the mahanadi valley to the nilgiris in the south unlike the western ghats the eastern ghats are discontinuous and irregular they are interspersed with several rivers that drain into the bay of bengal 
these rivers are the godavari the mahanadi the krishna and the kaveri Let's now compare the heights of the two ranges. The average elevation of the Western Ghats is 900 to 1,600 meters. On the other hand, the Eastern Ghats have an average elevation of about 600 meters only. Thus, the Western Ghats are taller than the Eastern Ghats. The height of the western ghats progressively increase from north to south. The highest peaks include the Annaimudi peak which is 2695 meters tall and the Dodda Beta peak which is 2637 meters tall. Compared to this the highest peak in the eastern ghats is the mahendragiri peak at 1501 meters the shevaroy hills and the javadhi hills are located to the southeast of the eastern ghats the shevaroy hills are famous for thriving coffee plantations pears oranges and bananas Yerkat a famous hill station is also a part of Shevaroy Hills The Javadhi Hills are one of the largest ranges of Eastern Ghats The map shows the location of some of the famous hill stations of this region Udagamandalam or Uti and Kodaikanal An interesting feature of the Western Ghats is orographic rainfall. Orographic rainfall is caused when a range of mountains intercepts rain-bearing monsoon winds. The Western Ghats intercept the westerly monsoon winds, forcing these winds to deposit most of their rain in the windward side, which is the western side. Therefore the area of the Deccan plateau to the east of the ghats receives very little rainfall The western ghats are known in different regions by different names For example people in Maharashtra refer to the western ghats as the Konkan coast while those in Kerala refer to them as the malabar coast one of the distinct features of the peninsula plateau is the black soil area known as the deccan trap the deccan trap is of volcanic origin did you know the volcanic beds of the deccan plateau were formed in the massive deccan traps eruptions about 66 million years ago The igneous rocks found in the region clearly indicate the volcanic origin of the Deccan plateau. The black soil in the plateau was formed as these igneous rocks denuded over time. These were the two broad divisions of the peninsula plateau. But before we complete the discussion on the peninsula plateau, let's take a look at its northwestern margins on the western and northwestern margins of the plateau you will find the aravalli hills one of the oldest ranges in the world the aravalli hills extend from gujarat to delhi in a southwest to northeast direction 
this range once had extremely tall hills. However, millions of years of weathering eroded them, and they are now broken hill forms. As you may remember from the previous module, the Aravali Hills lie on the western and northwestern margins of the peninsula plateau. If you move further towards the western margins of the Aravali Hills, you come across the Indian Desert. Like other hot deserts, the Great Indian Desert is a rolling sandy plain covered by sand dunes. Most of these are crescent-shaped sand dunes called Barkans. If you go to Jaisalmer in Rajasthan, you will be able to see a lot of Barkans. However, as you go near the Indo-Pakistan boundary, you will see a predominance of longitudinal dunes. Did you know Longitudinal dunes, also called Saif dunes, after the Arabic word for swot, elongate parallel to the prevailing wind. Saif dunes are thought to develop from Barkans if the direction of the wind changes. The rainfall in this region is quite low, below. 150 millimeters per year. Understandably, the arid climate is not suitable for plants to grow. Therefore, the vegetation cover in this region is sparse. During the rainy season, though some streams do appear. However, these streams do not have enough water to reach the sea. So, soon after the rainy season, they disappear slowly into the sand again. The only exception is the river Luni which is a large river. Let's go back to the peninsula plateau. As you can see, beyond the western ghats and the eastern ghats, the plateau is bordered by narrow coastal strips. The western strips run along the Arabian Sea, while the eastern strip is along the Bay of Bengal. As you can see, the western coast is a narrow plain. This plain is divided into three sections. Konkan, the Kannad plain and the Malabar coast. Konkan lies in the northern part of the coast. The beaches that form tourist attractions in Mumbai and Goa are part of the Konkan coast. The Kannad plain refers to the central part of the western coast. And right down in the south is the Malabar coast. Unlike the western coast, the eastern coast, which runs along the Bay of Bengal, displays wide and level stretches. Like the western coast, the eastern coast also has different local names. For example, in the northern parts, 
people refer to this coastal area as the Northern Sarkars. On the other hand, people in the south call it the Coromandel Coast. Let's take a look at the water bodies in this coast. You can see some large rivers such as the Mahanadi, the Godavari, the Krishna and the Kaveri. These rivers have formed a wide delta on the coast. The other important water body along the eastern coast is the Lake Chilika. This lake is said to be the largest salt water lake in India. It is located in Orissa to the south of the Mahanadi Delta. So far, we've covered all the physical features on the mainland of India. Moving off the mainland, the country also consists of two groups of islands or archipelagos. The Lakshwadeep Islands group and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. If you examine the Malabar coast of Kerala closely, lying close to the coast are the Lakshwadeep Islands. This group is famed for its variety of flora and fauna. One of the uninhabited islands in this group, the Pitti Island, has a bird sanctuary. Apart from that, the group overall consists of small coral islands. The name comes from the beautiful coral reefs that are a popular tourist attraction. Coral polyps are microscopic marine organisms which have short life spans. They flourish in shallow, mud-free, warm waters. They generally live in colonies. And how do they form such huge coral reefs? The reefs are built of a combination of hard rock-like secretion from the coral polyps and their skeletons. There are three main kinds of reefs. Barrier reef, fringing reef and atolls. A barrier reef is one that is separated from a mainland or island shore by a deep lagoon. The Great Barrier Reef of Australia is a good example. An atoll, on the other hand, is a circular barrier reef. There is no central island and the reef extends all the way around the lagoon, forming the shape of a horseshoe. Here is a view of the coral atolls in the Maldives, in the Indian Ocean. A fringe reef is one that is directly attached to a shore. Before 1973, the Lakshwadeep Islands were known as Lakar Dive, Minikoi and Amin Dive. The overall area of Lakshwadeep is 32 square kilometers. The island's administrative offices are headquartered on an island called the Kavarati Island. Let's move to the second group of islands which is located on the eastern side of the peninsula, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. It is a long chain of islands 
extending from north to south, located in the Bay of Bengal. There are numerous scattered islands in the chain. Most of them are bigger in size than those in the Lakshadweep Islands. The entire group of islands is divided into two broad categories. The northern islands are called the Andaman and the southern islands constitute the Nicobar category. Did you know the Andaman Islands and the Nicobar Islands are separated by the 10 degree north parallel? It is said that these islands are the elevated parts of a submarine mountain chain. As you can see from the map, this chain separates the Bay of Bengal from the Andaman Sea. These island groups are of great strategic importance for the country. These islands lie close to the equator. The equatorial climate has resulted in a thick forest cover. Thus, like the Lakshwadeep Islands, these islands display great diversity of flora and fauna as well. The most interesting feature of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands is that they house India's only active volcano. This volcano is located on the barren island. Each physiographic unit of India complements the others by providing valuable natural resources to the country. Let's take a moment to recollect the contribution of each unit to the development of the country. As you may remember, the northern mountains are the major sources of water as well as forest wealth. The granaries of the country lie in the northern plain, while the plateau provides vast mineral wealth to the country. These minerals have played a vital role in the country's industrialization. And what about the coastal regions? India's fishing sites are located in the coastal regions. Port activities are also focused around these regions. Thus, the diverse physical features of the land have immense future possibilities of development.